My name is Josh, and yeah, I'm, I'm headed out with this team. We just got back from Tanzania, but headed out again on Tuesday with this great group, and there's a couple people missing that are away at a wedding or sick, but we would covet your prayers. We're headed to Guadalajara to partner with a local church planting effort there, and if you've been around Westside any length at all, you know that we've got a big heart for church planting, and so we try to, whenever possible, um, through our global missions, partner with churches on the ground and, uh, and show up in a way that it blesses them. Um, would love your prayers. And for those of you who have been praying for us while we were away in Tanzania, thank you so much, so much. I, I would love to just take an hour and tell you stories of how we saw the Holy Spirit show up um, in incredible ways, ways that I want to weep over right now because God is so good. Um, but that's not what this morning's for. Um, August 25th, though, we are going to have a little session, kind of a debrief, question and answer period with the team. We'll have some photos. We're going to share stories that will boost your faith like crazy. And so mark your calendars. That's going to be probably after the gathering down in the commons. Um, this last two weeks in Tanzania, we saw 44 people respond to gospel invitations in some ways that have, I've just never seen before. So... Praise God, and um, thank you for your prayers. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 20 this morning, though, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them, um, your devices, paperback. we got Bibles in the back. If you don't have one, that's our gift to you. But open up to Joshua chapter 20. Um, while you do that, let me pray. Uh, Father, I love your word. I love your word. Thank you for the promises of it, that it doesn't return void. It accomplishes all that you set forth for it. And just the great reminder, um, coming back from a trip where we've seen that, going out to a trip where I know we're going to see that, and standing in front of um, 1,500 people here in the city that you've saved, that you've called to your purposes because your word doesn't return void. We park on that promise this morning, and we pray that as the word is opened, Holy Spirit, would you come and ignite it, fan it into flames in our hearts? What I've prepared this weak stack of kindling, unless you show up, Holy Spirit, it's nothing, so I just ask for your empowerment. Ask that Jesus' name would be heralded, and I ask this in the name of Christ, amen. All right, Joshua chapter 20. <clears throat> this is a noteworthy chapter. We've been going through this for a while, but this is a noteworthy chapter in our journey through Joshua because it includes, um, it opens with God speaking for the last time in the book of Joshua. And from what I can tell, this is the last time in the life of Joshua that God may have spoken. If you've been with us um, for our, our series, if you've read through the Old Testament at all, you know Joshua, he's, he's a great guy with a great name, um, took bold stands, he fought large battles, he led the people of God into the promised land, but he was a man who also knelt down, a man who sought the voice of God, and all through Joshua, we see him hearing from God over and over and over, um, God showing up, speaking directly. The first time, though, um, shows up in Joshua chapter one. I've got that up on the screen. And we've, we've went over this and over this throughout the series, but it's so good. I want us to see it again. Uh, it says, I'll just read it off the screen. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong, be very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, Joshua, that they may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. What God opens up charging and speaking Joshua um, to do is to read and know the law and then enact this instruction to, to carry it out. And this is what Joshua does. This is what, what happens. Um, the other times we see God showing up and speaking in the book of Joshua, often it's just God showing up and, and providing some clarification or, or providing some specific instruction on how they're to carry out this command. But chapter 21, or chapter 20, pardon me, sticks out in one way. Because it records God reminding Joshua and the people of a command that he's already given them. Chapter 20, we see God showing up and speaking a reminder. And so if you would read with me, chapter 20, verse 1. 
Then the Lord said to Joshua, say to the people of Israel, appoint the cities of refuge, which I spoke to you through Moses. God shows up and he says to Joshua, Joshua, do that thing I commanded you. Do that thing. And this is in reference, and I'm back to Numbers 35, where God spoke to Moses and he said, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, designate cities. Designate cities to serve as cities of refuge. Now, we know, if you've been here throughout the series, that they crossed the Jordan a little while ago. That was back in chapter 3, 17 chapters ago. Deuteronomy 19, we read, when the Lord your God cut off the nations whose land he's giving you, then, or sorry, pardon me, and when you have driven them out and settled in their cities and houses, then you are to set apart for yourselves cities of refuge. But, I mean, if you were here last week, you heard Mark Birch preach a a colossal amount of scripture uh, about how the land had been given out. It had been distributed. The land had been given over, but there's a command that they have yet to carry out. The command to set up cities of refuge. Now, what we're seeing is the Israelites enjoying the inheritance of God, but failing to live out a command that God has given them. And if you are anything like me, you've done this too. There's been many, maybe there still is, areas of your life where you're enjoying the benefits of God, but there's, there's an area you're holding back. There's, there's a section that you've con- conveniently forgotten to, to live out. Perhaps, like the Israelites, we're quick to run to God with the battles that we need him to show up in, but we're a little slow to obey God in the things that are well within our power to perform. I came across this quote from John Calvin a little while ago. I like it. Uh, He says, how tardy men are, not only to perform their duty, but to provide for their own safety, unless the Lord frequently urges them and pricks them forward by the stimulus of exhortation. I love this quote because it points out how even in our stubbornness and our rebellion, God graciously continues to pursue us and nudge us forward into obedience. Even if, and I I want you to notice, even if you're perhaps knowingly living in an area of rebellion or an area where you're really resisting surrender to God, I want you to see God here. I want you to see the character of God in display. Please see the God who shows up and lovingly calls his people back to him. God's already commanded Joshua to obey, but he shows up and, and lovingly reminds them because as we're going to see Joshua chapter 20 it's a a beautiful beautiful picture of God's grace towards us and from the very beginning God's attributes are being set right in front of us to take a look at and right off the bat here what we're seeing is that he is patient and gracious God's patient and gracious towards us but what is it? What, what, what is he instructing them to do? Well, God commands the Israelites to put aside, set aside six cities throughout all the land of Israel, a, a place of refuge, cities of refuge, a place someone could run uh, from what the text describes as an avenger of blood. Now that, that title, to be honest, it sounds a little bit more at home in a Tarantino movie than in the Bible. So you might be wondering, why didn't God just tell them to not avenge blood? What, I mean, if there wasn't avengers of blood, you wouldn't need cities of refuge. Why doesn't chapter 20 open with God saying, tell everyone in the land, don't kill people. And even if somebody kills someone, don't kill them. The reason is, blood needs to be avenged. Needs to be avenged. There needs to be an avenger of blood. If you will, uh, allow me. You don't have a choice, actually. I'm going to get a little nerdy with you for a minute. Um, This term, avenger of blood, translates in our text, avenger of blood. In Hebrew is the term ga'al hadam. Ga'al hadam, which means to redeem or to act as a kinsman. A ga'al hadam was a person's closest living relative. 
And they had a few different responsibilities um, that they were required to carry out. First of all, if one of their relatives were to fall into debt and be forced into indentured servitude, selling themselves into slavery, the Ga'al Hadam had the responsibility to go and rescue, buy back that person from slavery. A second responsibility of the Ga'al Hadam, though, was that if the ancestral land were to be seized by creditors, for example, the Ga'al Hadam had the responsibility to go and, and, and buy back to, to pay the debt against the land so that this distribution of land that we saw last week would stay in the family line. There was a third responsibility that a Ga'al Hadam um, had, or an avenger of blood had though, was that if his brother, say, was to die and leave behind a wife who had no child, he had the responsibility to, to marry this woman and, and, and help her have a son so that there would be a male inheritor of the land, so that that family line could be continued on and so that no branch of, of this distribution of the, the nation of Israel would go barren. We see this in the book of Ruth um, with guys like Boaz who, who come to rescue. And, and often when the Ga'al Hadam was fulfilling these three specific tasks, he was referred to as a kinsman redeemer. But there's a fourth responsibility that they had. And this fourth, fourth responsibility um, was to avenge the death of a family member. And, and when they were doing this, they would be referred to as the avenger of blood. Or as the New Living Translation um, puts it, a, a relative seeking revenge. Relative seeking revenge. And this title though it might sound a little jarring to us, it was actually a title of honor. It was a very honorable title for people at the time. Um, they were seen, though, in this title, not just as a representative of the family, but of God himself. Of God himself because in the Bible, God is continually referred to as an avenger of blood. So beginning back in Genesis 4, if you're familiar with the story of Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned, fell, removed from the garden. They have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain ends up killing his brother Abel, and God shows up in Genesis 4. And Genesis 4.10, he says to Cain, Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Abel's blood is literally crying out for avenging. And we could trace this all through the Old Testament. It's a fun little topical study for you if you want one this week, but we see it come together in, in Revelation 6 where God is described as the one, and I quote, who judges those who live on the earth and avenges their blood. God is an avenger of blood, and the Gahal Hadam was just God's agent. It was God's agent in carrying this out. I got a couple other verses there up on the screen I want to draw your attention to. Uh, first is Leviticus 24, and it says, If a man takes the life of anyone else, he must surely be put to death. Whoever kills an animal must make restitution, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, whatever he's done must be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Just as he injured the other person, the same must be inflicted on him. Uh, second verse, Genesis uh, 9, it says this. From your life blood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds, or sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. God is the avenger of blood. And this verse says that if someone sheds the blood of another, they're in turn to be killed by man. The one who was to do this is the Ga'al Hadam, the agent of God, the kinsman redeemer, the close relative of the person that was murdered. Now, I know this, this probably raises some eyebrows, some interesting questions. It brings up a lot of talking points, everything from abortion to capital punishment. Uh, I don't want to go there right now. We'd maybe put a pin in that. You guys can talk about that over lunch if you want. Um, what I want to point out is the reason why blood needs avenging. 
And, and the reason is because man is made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. And I don't want to pass over this too quickly. The only reason we have any more worth than bacteria is because of whose image we're made in. We are not great, great, great grandbabies of bluefin tuna. You are not just space dust colliding with space dust. The Bible says in Genesis that God came down and knelt down in the dirt and formed us. The Hebrew word is yasar. It's the same word that would be used for a, a potter forming together a clay pot. God came down and yasard us with his own hands. And more than that, he breathed his breath into us. The reason why blood needs defending is because we're made in the image of God and the breath of God is in us. Blood needs to be avenged because we are more than material beings. We are spiritual beings made in the image of God. This is why Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. That's the reason why. And the verse, this verse right there, Genesis 9, 6, it serves as a foundation for our modern law and ethics. And it's from this foundation, from this truth that has stemmed everything from, from the emancipation of slavery to the equality of women. It's verses like this that have brought change so women in India are no longer burned on the funeral pyres along with their husbands when they die. Because this verse gives worth and value to every single human being. Blood needs to be avenged because we're made in the image of God, but there's another reason that blood needs to be avenged. Because the sin of murder, like every other sin, affects not only individuals, but also the community around them. Sin has a communal effect. They don't just affect ourselves. They're, they're not just our sins. They're not just private sins. In the West, um, we, t we tend to think a lot more individualistically. So this can be hard to wrap our head around. But in most of the world and in the time of the Bible, there was a a corporate mindset. So in many places in the world today, if you create a, a felony or you sin or break your culture's code, you'll be removed from your clan. You'll be removed from your town. In the, in the time of the Bible, when this was written, if you were to commit a sin, you could be cast out of the camp and be put on the outside. Because sin wasn't just a private thing that you did. It had a corporate ramification. It had a, a, a corporate effect to it. We see this in the New Testament too. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says we are corporately the body of Christ and individually the members of it. And when one member suffers, so do the rest. And I think this is why in 1 Corinthians 5, we see Paul say to expel the immoral brother, meaning the one who won't repent of their sins, because he's bringing a, a toxin in, a sin in that's not just his own. It affects everything around it. Wes said, our sins are not our own. Our sins don't just have an effect on ourselves. Our sins don't just have an effect on our relationship with God. Our, our sins have an effect on the entire community around us because it takes all of us to be the image of God. This is why Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us our transgressions. Lead us not into temptation, it has a corporate effect. John Owen um, famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And we understand this correctly, we gotta understand that we need to be killing sin because sin is also killing and marring and affecting what we've been brought together as a community to do, which is to be an image of God. Sin needs to be killed because it affects the image of God. There's avengers of blood because the image of God needs defending and it's for this same reason that there are cities of refuge because the image of God needs defending. Um, so cities of refuge, they were provided as a place of help from those relatives seeking revenge who might be seeing red but none of the other colors in the spectrum. So someone gets getting a little, 
a um, little fired up, can't see things clearly. They're just on a blood rampage. The city of refuge was for that. Uh, Deuteronomy 19.10, it says that the cities needed to be built lest any blood be shed and the guilt of the innocent bloodshed be upon the community. So again, there's that communal aspect of, of the sin. Human worth, it's saying, needs to be defended, but it needed to be done according to the rules of justice, the rule of law. And it's worthy of a mention before we go on that apart from a biblical worldview, there is no foundation for a rule of law. When law is not anchored in God's revealed will, when it becomes untethered from the, our heavenly moral law giver, then it has no foundation. There can be no common foundation of right or wrong. And this is where kind of postmodernistic philosophy is leading us in a hurry. When we become untethered from any sort of absolute moral authority from, from the God of the universe, we can end, there's no saying where we're going to end up. And a place where there's no consistent law, no consistent standard, it's, it's not a good place. It's not a good place. The, the culture around the Israelites at this time, it had no common rule of, of law. They, there was nothing consistently doled out and applied. Somebody could murder someone and just toss a little bit of money and have it all be brushed under the rug. If they were high enough in society, they, they had immunity. And stuff like this goes on today too. I was in Thailand in 2012 and um, one of the, um, a young man who comes from the family who owns Red Bull, he was whipping around in his Ferrari. He's doing 100 kilometers an hour over the speed limit and crashed into a police officer. Just drove away. They found him later. Seven years later, he's still not in jail. Can't be held accountable. And the people of the country are crying out, hey, we want accountability. But they're billionaires. And, and he just pays police officers off. This is not justice. We know that. That's corruption. We need a standard of law. We need a rule and a, we need justice in order for society to function. And the Avengers of Blood, part of their role was to carry this out and to ensure that justice was enacted. But cities of refuge were needed for protection as well to ensure that those who were wrongly accused of murder weren't killed without receiving a just trial. What I, what I want us to see here, West Side, in chapter 20, is that God presents himself as a God who is both just and merciful. And that's good news. That's important. We have a God who is just enough, enough to judge and merciful in providing a place of refuge for those where they seek trial. Now, I want to invite you to just read on with me and, and see how these cities functioned. In verse 4, we read, He shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders. They shall take him in, give him a place, and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment till the death of the high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town, in his own home, to the town from which he fled. Let me, let me give you an example of how this would play out. Let's just say um, a farmer's out in the field. He's baling together some, some hay. Um, he's wrapping it up with some twine. He puts a bow on it. And right as he cuts the twine, this bale starts to roll. And it rolls and it's eventually, it, it begins as a very gradual slope but it's building momentum, it's building momentum. Eventually this bale of hay is on a very steep incline and it's barreling down, down the slope at very high speed. And at the bottom, it's a little pond and there's a, there's a guy standing there, I don't know, watching some birds and this bale of hay hits him and knocks him into the pond. And, and man can't swim so he drowns. Standing nearby is the man's brother, just so happens. He's also a birder and a non-swimmer. So he can't go in and get his brother from the pond. 
he looks back and he sees the farmer up the hill, pale-faced and shocked. So he sets out after the, far, after the farmer. The farmer has a couple options. But the best of which is he runs to a nearby city of refuge. And they say this was approximately a half day's journey from any one place in the kingdom. So he flees to the city. He gets to the doors. He knocks. He explains his case to the elders. And they let him in and shut the door and provide a safe place for him until a trial could be set up. We know Deuteronomy 19, it says that um, only on the evidence of two or three witnesses can any charge be established. We know that Numbers 35 says, no person, no, ah, no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. So if this man was found not guilty, he could remain then inside of the city of refuge. But... If they found him to be guilty, negligent, if he had done something, could have prevented something, if he'd hated this man in the past, the relative seeking revenge was to take him out of the city and put him to death. And I, I want to I acknowledge that for some, the idea of someone dying rather than being rehabilitated or incarcerated for the rest of his life, that might seem barbaric. But in order to understand a text like this, what we need to remember is that not only does the God of the universe have ownership over all of human life, the Bible also presents to us a God who is just. Justice is one of God's attributes. There is no justice that exists apart from God. Justice is just God's will revealed. And so we can know for certainty that God is just in this situation because he is the standard of justice. While this might appear maybe heavy-handed or, or a little too firm for some in the room, the description for how a city of refuge should function, it would have positioned Israel as a beacon of hope to all that were around at the time. The idea that there would be a city that you could flee to in a time of need middle of situations and misfortunes, it, would, it, it set Israel apart it, really uniquely at the time. Now, justice like this, it was light years ahead of the countries around them. Furthermore, these cities of refuge were open to all. So after listing the names of these six cities, verse 9 says, these cities are there for the people of Israel but also for the strangers. These cities of refuge were beacons of hope to, to Israel, but also everyone around. It broadcasted to the world the message that the God of Israel was not only just, he was merciful. These cities were God's provision of grace, a, a, an act initiated by God in order to protect people. And they were available to anyone who could flee to them. And Westside, what I want us to see is that this text comes so vividly alive when we see that these nine verses aren't just painting the picture of some unique justice system in early Israelite history. They're painting the picture of a unique salvation available to us today. This text, it's not just speaking about six cities in Israel, a place where ancient Israelites could run to refuge. It's pointing forward to the person of Jesus whom we can find refuge in today. Whereas these places of refuge were open to unintentional manslayers then, Jesus is open to all. Jesus is a place of refuge for everyone today. Verse 3, it says that there was a rightful avenger of blood in the ancient Israelite culture, so too do we have a rightful avenger of blood. Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death, and Romans 3.23 tells us that all of us have sinned. All of us, when we understand it correctly, have an avenger of blood coming for us who is just in judging us for our sins. And just as verse 4 says, these cities served as a place of shelter for, uh, from the avenger of blood, providing justice, protection, and provision, so too does Jesus provide shelter 
today to all who will run to him. Psalm 9.9, we read, the Lord is a stronghold to the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Just as verse 5 said that the citizens of the city would not deliver the person who fled into the city over to the hands of the manslayer, so too will Christ not allow any who have sought refuge in him to be put to shame. Romans 10.11 says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Westside, Jesus is our city of refuge. But the great news, the great news, because that's already really great news, the great news is whereas in Joshua only accidental killers could come, now the gates are open to all, all who come and knock. Up on the screen, Romans 10.9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 13, it says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you are in Christ, if you have made him your city of refuge, you will not be put to shame. You have that hope. If you have made Jesus your refuge, you are safe from the avenger of blood. But I need to ask us, is this what you're trusting in for refuge? What are you trusting in for refuge? When you one day stand in front of the God of the universe and he says, why should I let you in? What do you plan on saying? If it's anything but Jesus is my refuge, it's going to come up short. Acts 4.12, it says, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved or men can be saved. Verse 7, so they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. Beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, they appointed Bezer in the wilderness on the tableland from the tribe of Reuben and Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad and Golan and Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities designated for all the people of Israel and for the strangers sojourning among them that anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there that he might not die by the avenger of blood. Um, as I was studying this week, I came across um, and some work someone had done linking together each of these place names with the fulfillment in Christ. It was really quite interesting. Um, I, I, I want to share some of this with you because I think it's beneficial and it really helps us to see Jesus as the fulfillment of these cities of refuge. Um, the name Kadesh, the first off in verse 7, this translates, it, it meant holy place. And what we see is in Revelation 21, Jesus being described as our temple, our, our holy place in the New Jerusalem. The second place, Shechem, uh, it means strong shoulder. The author linked together how Hebrews 6.18 says, Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence. And the King James would say strong consolation or a strong shoulder to lean on. Hebron, the third place, the town, it, it, the name Hebron means fellowship. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says that we've been called into fellowship with Jesus. Bezer means strong hiding place. And Colossians 3.3 3 says that our life, if we're in Christ, is now hidden with Christ in God. Ramoth, it means high place. And Ephesians 2.6 says that we've been made to sit with Christ in the heavenly places. Golan, it, it means enclosure for captives. And it's, the author linked together how Ephesians 4 says that Jesus came and is described as leading captivity captive. He took the captives and freed them to a better enclosure. He led captivity captive. Jesus, when we see this, is screaming off the text as our place of refuge, our place to run with all our sins, our secure hope, our strong tower, our strong shoulder to lean on, and our safe enclosure. He's also our place of encounter with the living God. And what I'm most excited about in this text, this gets me giddy. Jesus 
is being shown to be our high priest. In verse 6, it says that the guilty party would come into the city. And if he was found not guilty, pardon me, the, the offending party would come into the city. And if he was found not guilty, he had to live the rest of his lives out in the enclosure of this city to be ensured protection. But on the day that the high priest died, all of this man's records, all of his past sins, everything that anyone had against him were to be forgiven and he was free to leave the city and live the rest of his life out. I said, Jesus as our high priest not only opened the doors to a city of refuge for us, he kicked them down. If we've come into him for refuge, not only are our sins covered, they're forgiven. We're free. We not only have refuge from the consequences of our sins, we have freedom from the consequences of them as well. Romans 8.1 says, There's thou, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the good news of Christianity. This is the unique news of Christianity. We have a refuge. We have a high priest who died for us. You can be free from the guilt of your sin because of what Jesus has done. And I believe there's people here this morning who have been trying to take care of their own sins. You've been running. You're running from the avenger of blood. You've been dragging the weight of your past sins, your past shame, your reputation, your guilt, and you feel like a prisoner. You want to be free, but you don't know how. Nowhere you go seems to offer it. You want to stop running, and, and I just want to tell you, the place to go is Jesus. The place to go, your city of refuge, has a name, and his name is Jesus. And if you have yet to run to him, can I encourage you that you are not here by accident this morning? that God is already in pursuit of you. I want to encourage you to put your hope in the verse that says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus is not even waiting for you to come knock at the door. He's already standing on the inside knocking. If that's you, and there are people in this room, you've yet to trust in Jesus this morning is your morning. Today's your morning. I want to encourage you to respond. Um, not yet. We're going to have a time of response in a bit. But there will be couples in the corner. If you go to one of them and just say, I want to surrender my life to Christ. I want to enter the city of refuge. They'll walk through that with you. Maybe you came with someone and you can just do that where you are. Don't leave the building if you do this without filling out one of the prayer cards and just saying, I decided to follow Jesus and write your name because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. You can come find me, and I will pray with you through this too. But there is an invitation this morning to enter a city of refuge. And some of you need to grab hold of that. Now, I want to close because I think that there's people that need to respond, but I can't yet. Because there's some goodness here that we need to see still. In the same way, Joshua led the people into the promised land, and, and he set up cities of refuge. Jesus, whose name means Joshua in Greek, by the way. Jesus, the true and better Joshua, leads us into the promised land, and he sets up cities of refuge as well. They're called the local church. Jesus is the fulfillment of the cities of refuge, but the church is described all through the Bible as being the fullness of Christ here on earth. So rightly understood, Westside, we are the fullness of Jesus Christ. We are the presentation of Christ to this city. Therefore, we are a city of refuge for this city. We are to be a church of refuge. Like Shechem, we're to be a strong shoulder for those in times of need. Like Bezer, we're to be a place to hide. Like Golan, we're supposed to be a safe enclosure of community. And like Hebron, um, Hebron, we're to be a place to encounter the living God. The world around, it runs short on mercy, radically short on mercy. And the church, we need to be a place where people can flee their situations, their misfortunes, 
their screw-ups, their past sins, their sexual history, their criminal records, their reputations, all the things that have been weighing them down. We need to be a place of freedom for them. Because every single person here inside of this church, we're just a group of people who've run to Jesus for help too. We're just a group of people who've come knocking at the door, pleading for mercy. So the church then is the only community in the world where people can come and find mercy instead of judgment. Westside, what if God placed us here? What if God gave us the center? What if God put us in the center of downtown Vancouver because he wants us to be a church of refuge for this whole city? What if he's got a plan through us whereby people come and find refuge? Man, I want that. I believe that's what God's doing. But there's a cost to this. When, when someone fled the, their ancestral land and came to the city of refuge, there was a cost to the city. They, they not only needed to maintain walls of defense, they, verse 4 says, had to give him a place. They had to have places ready for people as they fled. They had to have things for them to do. It had a material cost, but it also had a relational one. Material cost because they had to provide these things, but a relational cost because when people showed up, they, they came without the community, without the family, without the social network that they'd grown up around. They have none of that anymore. You know, that's how many people come into here. Being a church of refuge for Vancouver is, is going to cost us preferences because we're going to have to live our lives not just in the pure pursuit of ourselves and our own pleasure, but for the glory of God and good of others. It's going to necessitate that we change how we use our time. We might not get to binge all of season three of Stranger Things in a week. I have to open your home up, let people come watch Stranger Things with us. <laughs> um, it's going to cost us relationally, but it's going to cost us emotionally as well. Because people, people seeking refuge often come in with some baggage and some carry-on, just like we did. But it's worth it. It's going to cost us financially because people are going to come in hurting and needing help. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Because it's going to have a reward as well. The reward of seeing people freed. The reward of seeing people finding refuge, finding hope, finding joy, finding purpose. Coming into connection with their creator. Seeing families transformed. And ultimately seeing the city transformed. And I believe that's why God put us here. The city of refuge. A church of refuge for the city. I want to close just with a couple quick questions. What role do you play in this church being a place of refuge? What role do you play? I, I don't have the answers for you. But I know you play one. What is the Lord calling you to do in us being a, a church of refuge for this city? What's the cost? Maybe, maybe that's you own a business and you're going to take some chances on some people that don't look great on paper. Maybe you're going to open your home for hospitality to some people you maybe wouldn't have typically opened up your home for hospitality to. This is the loneliest city in the world, apparently. Everyone who comes into here says they're lonely. Church, we could change this. We could be part of God changing the city just through being more hospitable. What's the Lord calling you to do as a member of this church's role in being a city of refuge? And Lastly, I want to ask you, who do you know? Who do you know that needs refuge that you could tell about Jesus? God's up to something in this city. We got a part to play in it. And I just want to encourage you, hopefully help you see a vision for what God could do through here. 
My prayer is that we've seen Christ come alive off the pages of this, this text and seen him as a place of refuge in a new way as well. I want to um, invite the band up. We're going we're gonna to go into a time of response now. As I mentioned, we will have couples in the corner that would love to pray with you. So if there's anything going on, please make use of that. As well, we're going to have communion servers and um, they're going to have bread and wine. So you come forward and take the bread and dip it into the wine or the juice according to your conscience. Remember that in the same way this bread absorbs the wine, that Jesus has absorbed all of the wrath of God reserved for us. We take this in remembrance and celebration to, to just remember what Jesus has done. If you are not yet a Christian, Don't come forward and take communion. Stay in your seat. Take Jesus this morning. Call out for saving. (laughs) And um, we'll have someone up at the back end with more instructions as well. Just a reminder that if you want to respond to this call to to follow Christ this morning, make use of a prayer couple, come find me. But don't leave the building without filling out a prayer card and letting us know that you've done this, please. Let me close this in prayer. And Jesus, I thank you. Thank you that you are a place of refuge. Thank you that what we see in dim, in Joshua 20, we see just beautifully revealed in your person. Thank you, God, that you came and rescued us, weary sinners in need of redemption. You're our rescuer, our rescuer. And I pray we would leave with our faith bolstered. And I pray that you would, out of this place, please make your name made great. Save our city, save thousands more. Bring to mind people who you're already working on, Holy Spirit. And I pray this morning on those individuals who you've been in pursuit of, that their heart would be warmed. You'd you'd just do that work and you'd save some here this morning, Jesus. We're desperate for you. We're thankful for you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.